All right, thank you for joining us, everyone. My name is Bob Bruner. I am the A&R Extension Educator for Clay and Owen Counties in Indiana, for those of you who are coming from out of state. Uh, tonight, this is the second session in our Invasive Species Program. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about one that I've had a chance to work with quite a bit, known as Multiflora Rose or Rosa Multiflora. Um, this is a gorgeous but insidious little plant that has a major part that it's played qu through quite a bit of human history, actually. Now, one thing I will state very clearly is that in the eastern United States, this plant is considered invasive and it can wreak absolute havoc. And it has especially done so here in Indiana, particularly in the areas where I work, which has a lot of natural hardwood ecosystems. So first off, where did this plant originally come from? Well, like most invasive plants, um, this plant was introduced by human beings. Uh, it is native to Japan, Korea, and China, a significant portion of Asia. We brought it here intentionally as rootstock for the purposes of creating ornamental roses. Um, it was an excellent choice in the sense that it is a very resilient plant that has lovely white and pink blossoms. So there are two different ver uh, variants of Rosa Multiflora. I can't recall their names, I apologize, but the difference between them is that one produces white blossoms, the other produces pink. Here in Indiana, we have both of those variants, um, so, but they are both multifloral rows. We also discovered that they were actually useful as soil conservation structures because they help control a great deal of erosion and land movement because of the way their roots are structured and the way they can root from canes themselves, from the tips of their canes. However, this plant came with a few drawbacks. Going backwards on me here. So due to the fact that this plant is able to thrive in well-drained soils, which is a lot of Indiana, it likes to take advantage of edge spaces where one habitat ends and the other one begins. So it's able to easily invade places like old fields and meadows, pastures, roadsides where we were previously intentionally planting it, and in the case where I do a lot of work in forest understory. And I'm going to show you guys in a little bit some of the work I did with one of our state parks to try to help them combat multiflora rose. This plant is particularly aggressive because it is not native, it is an invader. So that means that there are no natural enemies that will recognize it. There are no natural controls amongst other plants that can help prevent it from spreading. It's also got a very interesting way, not only do they go through seeding, it is a true rose, so it does have rose hips, but it can also do what's referred to as layering. And I'm going to explain what layering is in just a little bit. So one thing that I want to bring to your attention before we get any further is that multiflora rose is not the polyantha rose or the polyanthus rose. Polyantha roses came from a cross between Rosa multiflora and Rosa chinensis. This is an ornamental. It does not have the more unpleasant traits of its ancestor. So it doesn't spread uncontrollably. It doesn't invade other ecosystems. It's just a nice ornamental that's particularly bushy and particularly resilient. There's actually a picture of um, polyantha rose in the background of this image. Um, polyantha roses are actually the basis of a lot of our modern roses. This one, polyantha roses, were created in 1866. This is what we use that multiflora rose rootstock for. However, it is not the invader. So don't confuse that for, some, for the plant that's the actual problem. So let's get started by first identifying multiflora rose. Now, like I said, this is a true rose, so it's going to form rose hips that will uh, stay as seeds and stratify over the winter in the cold. You're going to be able to fairly easily recognize them when they're doing going through the rose hip phase because they produce this very balloon-like shape that's very, very red in color. Um, unfortunately, the seeds that it produces are extremely resilient. They can persist in the soil for up to 20 years, possibly longer. So that means that if you have a multiflora rose problem and you allow it to go to its seeding phase and it gets into the ground, you're going to continue to have a multiflora rose problem. 
Um, I'm going to go over this in a little while, but I'm just going to state right now that combating multi-floor rows is going to be a multi-year project for you. And there's just, there's simply nothing you can do about that. So it's best to identify when this plant has invaded and get to it early before it seeds. Now, Ronald, I see you asking, is it in the Rugosa family? I believe it is not, but I want to double check that. I was reading on it earlier and I know the answer to that question, but I want to look it back up again so I can tell you correctly. Um, so I'm gonna move on from that though, and I wanna talk a little bit about the canes of multiflora rows. Now the canes represent a really, really serious problem. This is where things can get really, really nasty with the multiflora rows. This image is actually kind of showing you some of that story. What you see here is that this rose bush is twining around a now dead tree it's probably going to continue twining around other plants. You can see some of it in the background. The canes are one of its strongest attributes. These things can get up to six to 13 feet. I've actually seen them longer than that, in fact. Um, and when the tips are green and they come in contact with the soil, they will go through what's referred to as layering, where those tips will now begin to put in roots into the soil and become a brand new rose plant. This is why when you are working with multiflora rows, you are not just facing a single rose plant, you're facing this dense, thick, impossible mass of briar that you now have to go through. All of these canes are covered in extremely sharp thorns. And many of us who have done conservation work or have had to remove this have had our experiences with multiflora rose thorns. Um, and I've gotten stuck by plenty of thorns in my time, and I will definitely tell you multiflora rose is the worst. The canes are everywhere. They're just messed up with each other, all kinds of crazy formations of them. It's an, if you put your hand in it, you're going to come out with some cuts on yourself. Yeah, it, I see what you're saying there, Nicole. And it's, it is just one of the trials we have to deal with. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was teaching a class at McCormick's Creek near one of the unfortunate infestations of multiflora rows. And I had to warn the students I was teaching to watch where they walked because if they were not watching, they were gonna walk directly into one of the briars and it was just gonna shred their clothing, their coats, everything. So like I said, this layering can cause these thick briars that can cover a significant area. And by the way, they're not weak. These don't snap off in your hand. They're not going to be super dry. These are extremely strong. They're usually green for a long time, even after other plants have gone dormant. So that means that they're able to bounce back from a lot of damage much later into the year. And they create this near impassable barrier, meaning that you're going to need equipment often to simply just remove chunks of it. OK, a little bit now on our blooms. Um, there's only so much you can say about multiflora rose blooms. They are just like other roses. Um, they will bloom according to the time of year. They typically will bloom earlier. They will green up earlier as well. I'm gonna talk about that momentarily. And they're gonna produce these really quite lovely white or pink blooms that are very showy. They're very easily noticed. So during certain times of the year, if you look in the forest understory, you're gonna know where the roses are. Um, this is why they made such a good option for rootstock to create the polyantha rose, because they're so resilient, their blooms are very obvious, they are very, very true, and they have, honestly, they are quite fragrant, depending on where you are, um, and they have good size, too. They're not real super tiny. So they kind of made this perfect storm of something we wanted to use, but unfortunately, we didn't think through the process quite far enough. So let's talk a little bit about our leaves. This is what I want all of you to use as the primary way to identify multiflora rows. The leaves are always going to be very, very consistent. They're going to leaf out much earlier in the spring. So about when you started to see things greening up about four weeks ago, the things that were greening up were one of two plants for the most part. Asian bush honeysuckle, which I talked about last week, and multiflora rows. Um, I actually worked with McCormick's Creek, and I'm going to show you a little bit of this in the future, or in the near future, and I took a lot of drone imagery to track their multiflora rows, and I was able to do so because I did it at the right time of year before anything else greened out. Now here it says the leaves are pinnate with a toothed edge, and they're alternate. 
Let me go back to the previous image. Now, if you look here, it looks like the leaves are actually opposite, not alternate. Well, that goes back to that pinate word right there. What you're seeing here, this little sprig of leaves, that's actually one leaf and the green parts are leaflets that are positioned opposite each other. But if you look at the main cane on the plant, you can see that these leaves with leaflets are springing out at an alternate pattern from each other. That's what pinate is going to mean. So keep that in mind. They are alternate, even though they don't look like it. The leaflets are also always going to be toothed, which you can see very, very clearly in this image. And they're gonna green up just before anything else will. One good thing about multiflora rose, it's also subject to all the same pests and diseases that ornamental rose are too. So you'll, I'm gonna show you, I believe in a little bit, an example of that. All right, so getting to some of the work that I did with McCormick's Creek that I keep referring back to. Um, Multiflora rose can have an incredibly negative impact on hardwood ecosystems. Our state parks constantly are in combat with them. Uh, the image you're looking at right here is one that I took from my drone. I'm a drone pilot. I, I fly a uh, Phantom 4 Pro, and I used mine to map out the multiflora rose infestation near a nature preserve referred to as Wolf Cave in McCormick's Creek State Park. I'm not able to fly over the nature preserve because of federal law, but I was able to fly outside of it so we could map out the plants, and it was really convenient because they hadn't entered the nature preserve yet. So we took our time going over the landscape to see what was greening up. Essentially, if it's not a tree and it's green, it's multiflora rose in this picture. We had to ground truth it and we, we double checked. The drone was very accurate. Um, what's going on with McCormick's Creek is they are trying to make triage decisions when it comes to what patches of the roses that they're going to eliminate. By mapping them out, they can make decisions on which ones they'll be able to effectively use their time with and which ones honestly won't be worth the time. Unfortunately, this rose is doing exactly what I described it doing. It's choking out a lot of the native tree development, taking advantage of areas where there are nice, beautiful glades opened up and there's sunlight coming through. And they're making those portions completely impassable to the park's guests and the wildlife that needs to use it. So what happened was in I believe February of last year, the interpretive naturalists over at McCormick's Creek Park asked me if I could fly my drone over certain areas to help them map it out. And we did that, and we got a lot of great imagery that they've since used to work on eradication. Now, to give you a slightly better idea of what we are looking at, inside this red circle, that is one very, very large briar of multiflora rose right there, and pretty much everything else around it is as well. Whenever we encountered a canopy opening, we were able to find where those briars were developing the strongest. So basically, if the sunlight could come through, the roses were going to start springing up. That seed bank would go ahead and activate and grow and grow and grow. Now, what was going on was that we were able to take advantage of the roses ecology because we knew the trees obviously weren't leafing out yet, but the roses were. So that means that we could very, very easily map them with very little energy put into it. All you had to do was spend about 45 minutes with a drone out where we were flying just to map out the edges. We didn't need a real detailed map. We just needed a generalized area. And then the park could put its naturalists to work on their eradication processes. Um, that is a lot of work they did. Um, I have seen a lot of them come back uh, very bloody, unfortunately. They've had to use heavy equipment. They've had to use herbicides, unfortunately, to get rid of them. But they have been overall successful in their efforts. Like I said earlier, it's going to be an ongoing process for them to continue to remove this. Now, I want to continue to talk a little bit more about what I just was with removal and control options. Um, and I will be very, very honest with you. There is no magic bullet here. There is no silver bullet. There's not going to be an easy guaranteed way to remove it. First things first, it's going to take a lot of work. The best thing to do, though, I will start with is to get to it as early as possible. If you let this grow even a little bit, it can very quickly become a seriously challenging effort, especially for those of us who might not be able to move around as easily. Uh, or who don't have a whole lot of time on our hands to work on removing this. 
it can regrow from the root system. So even if you chop off the top, it's gonna keep going. And the seed bank, like I mentioned earlier, can persist for decades. Severe infestations can be really, really challenging to navigate because they form that impassable barrier. So you're not, you're not only looking at using a saw, you may be looking at using heavier equipment at that point. Now, like I said, you can remove them by hand. You just need to make sure you've accounted for the danger from the thorns. The earlier, the better. The root system must come all the way out. You don't wanna leave a single bit of it in, it will regrow from it. And it'll do so with an alarming speed. Um, don't even attempt to remove a heavy infestation by hand. You're gonna, the chances of you injuring yourself and just burning up your own energy and time is so high, it's going to honestly be best to get rent or hire in some equipment to help you take that out. Now you can use mowing, but it's best done when the plants are younger and you're gonna need to do it at least three to six times throughout a season because you've got to keep that stuff down. You don't want to get it, you don't wanna let it get beyond its tender stage. You want it to stay nice and tender and green so that way it doesn't harden up. Um, however, if you're mowing, that's a lot of time and it can be costly because I don't know about you, but I just saw today that gas prices are somewhere around $4.19. So that's gonna hit you in the pocketbook a little bit. Now, if we're looking at something heavier, we're talking about excavation with using a backhoe, a bulldozer, or even a tractor with a chain. The big problem with these is that you really do need to make sure you get all that root system. And as soon as those pieces of equipment are done with their work, you need to go in with a follow-up treatment of some kind of herbicide or something else to make sure that you're keeping them down. And I would say you wanna do that with a mowing, pro a mowing effort as well. Now, there are some biological controls that can also help us out. These aren't going to completely eliminate a rose infestation, but they will help tamp it down quite a bit. Now, one of the primary controls is a disease known as rose rosette disease. If you've been at any of my rose programs, you know I've talked about this before. Uh, rose rosette disease, or RDD, also has another name. Sometimes we refer to it as witch's broom. It's very common in several types of roses, including multiflora rose. And oftentimes what happens is that a multiflora rose plant is infected. It will get um, kind of parasitized by a mite, and then that mite will travel to ornamental roses and spread the disease. You can also accidentally spread the disease through grafts because some people will try to graft uh, rosa multiflora and try to create new plants still. Um, that's pretty much not a great idea unless you're an expert at it. Now, uh, RDD or RRD has a telltale sign of reddening in the leaves. It will begin to warp the plant and it'll, it just won't look right. You'll look at it and you'll be like, that looks like it's almost a rose plant, but it doesn't look quite right to me. The plant's going to stunt and eventually it'll die. This is what the disease looks like when it is active. Um, and I know it's in my area. I live in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, and I know that there, there are lots of businesses in town that have planted roses. And I know this because I've noticed the fact that they are infected with witch's broom and they look like this. So keep an eye out for this if you are fighting your rose infestation, it will help you out. You just wanna make sure that it doesn't travel to your roses at home. Uh, oh, a few more things I should add to this too. I kind of said this earlier. Um, they will not kill, it probably won't kill the plants. It will just severely weaken them. It will really inhibit their ability to reproduce. Um, and of course, like I said, it easily spreads. All right, now onto chemical controls. Um, these plants can respond to things like glyphosate, triclopyr, sulfuron, methyl, and a few other chemicals. I believe dicamba is also in there. Um, before you consider any application, what I want you all to do is to first you need to go in and damage those plants. Damage them by cutting them, mowing them, whatever, so that way you are inducing a stress reaction in the plant and they will not be able to handle the uh, chemical application nearly as well. This will also reduce your surface area to treat if you're gonna do some kind of foliar treatment. So you're just making your future work easier on yourself. But just like how I described with our Asian bush honeysuckle last week, your application timing is going to be very, very important. So let's talk a little bit about that for a moment. 
So foliar treatments, you can do them anytime during the growing season, but you do need to keep in mind that those foliar treatments will affect other plants nearby. You can do misting and you can do spraying, but you really need to watch what else is in the area. Now, there is some good news about that though. Oftentimes when there's a severe multiflora rose infestation, there isn't much else growing near them. They choke things out, but we do wanna keep our eyes open for that. Our cut stump, cut stem, and basal bark treatments can be done anytime, but there are ideal times of year when you can do them. And then some treatments may have different timing based on the medium that you're using to transport that active ingredient, i.e., are you using water or oil? Now, if you were with us last week, you may have heard me talk about using a water-based uh, carrier, which means like if you cut the multiflora rose, you need to immediately treat it with the water-based herbicide so that way the plant uptakes it. Or if you're using an oil-based carrier, then you can cut the plant and wait a little bit and then put the oil, paint the oil treatment on there because it'll just seep into the plant no matter what, it'll stay there. Key things though about that, if you do either of those treatments, you need to make sure you don't have runoff. Be very careful when you paint them on. The water one usually isn't too big of a danger, but the oil one can very easily run off. So keep that in mind if you're using either of those mediums. Now I showed uh, people this last week, for those of you who are there, for those of you who weren't, um, this is actually, this is, was created by Sikkim. They are now the uh, state of Indiana Cooperative Invasive Management Organization, uh, not the Southern Indiana one. They've since changed their name. Sikkim does a lot of great work in combating invasive species, and they created this calendar of control recommendations. And when I post the recording to this, I will make sure there is a link to this calendar, and I will see if I can get the PDF to send to all of you as well. Now, what I'm showing you here is when you can do treatments of a variety of plants, and I'm going to highlight the parts that include multiflora rows. Now, you may note that this is the same treatment schedule you can use for Asian bush honeysuckle, which makes it pretty convenient. So if you have more than one plant that is causing you a problem that's in this same group, well, good news, you can do all your treatment efforts at one time. Now, one thing to highlight here, let's talk about our foliar spray. It is highlighting that it can be done May through September. Now, the main reasons for that are that's when you're going to have the best leafing out and it's not going to be continuing to grow out new leaves as rapidly. Early March and April, that's when most of the leaves are gonna get put on. So you, by waiting until May, you're getting past that point. You can go ahead and do your foliar treatments. You've already got all the leaves there. Uh, cut surface treatment can be extremely effective from June through March. The reasons for that is, is that we are now getting to the plant in a time period when other plants are going to be disappearing and these plants will not yet have gone dormant. So they will stay active much later on into the fall than any other plant. So that way you can freely use an herbicide without risk of damaging other plants in the environment. And just using those cut surface treatments is just safer in general to avoid any unintentional pesticide travel. And then our basal bark treatment can be very effective. It also is something that we are going to do during dormant seasons, but I want you to consider this. I showed you a picture of severely layered canes earlier this evening. That means that if you're gonna do a basal bark treatment, you've somehow got to get to that bark to do your treatments. And those canes do not make that easy. So this should be done in consideration with some kind of process to begin cutting and taking apart some of these bushes before you make an application. Because if you don't, you're, you're simply going to be walking through a wall of thorns at that point. So you have to do some work ahead of time so that way these treatments can be effective. All right, so one last thing that I keep adding to all of these, uh, I'm gonna give you guys a picture of a baby goat, one, because I think it's cute, and two, because uh, goats have actually got some evidence that they can help control invasive plants by releasing them into places where these invasive plants are, they will take them down to the ground. I don't know how effective they would be with multiflora rose though, because of just the canes can be so bad and I'd be concerned about your goats getting injured on the thorns. But if you are releasing them out early enough when the plants are still tender, you might get some efficacy from it. Um, Purdue is continuing to do some research on this to see how effective it will be. 
Um, and I will definitely update this information as I learn more. All right, so I've got my contact information posted right here. Uh, I, like I said earlier, my name is Bob Bruner. I'm in Clay and Owen counties with Purdue Extension. I have both my phone numbers from my offices and my email. I've also got links to our Purdue Ed store, which can help you find publications on multiflora rows and other plants, and a link to our Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. Um, they can help you identify plant issues and get you solutions. You just have to send them a sample.